title of our message series is First, and today I want to talk about the Great Pursuit. Key scriptures, Matthew 6 and 33, and this, you should, if you have a bulletin, I always put a bulletin outline, a message outline in your bulletin, you can follow along. Key scripture, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Mark 12 and 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Two weeks ago, we studied the four kingdoms. We can, we're supposed to seek first the kingdom. What other kingdoms are there? There's the kingdom of this world. It's where you live. There's the kingdom of darkness. That's the devil's kingdom. And then there's the kingdom of make-believe. That's where a lot of Christians live, where they think spiritual things that are only true in their mind, okay? Last week, we discussed and talked about the process of balancing your life in this world and your life seeking first the kingdom because you live in this world. And God's even told us that we, we're supposed to go to work. If we don't work, we don't eat. We're supposed to have a job. He told us to be fruitful and multiply. That means have kids. That's a great idea until you have three screaming kids. You know, kids take a lot of work, and, and, and some of you moms know. I, I, I mean, and and thank, thankfully, we had a, a nice event for you yesterday to come get refreshed a little bit. But, but some of you moms know those kids, they just they go through laundry, you know, and they need food, and they need all sorts of things. And, 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 and so we're in this world. We have to live. We got to go to work. We got to do laundry. We got to go grocery shopping. We got to do all those things. And yet, we're supposed to seek first the kingdom. The process of balancing that is called stewardship, managing the life that God gave you. First Peter 4.10, the NIV version says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace and its various forms. And that brings us to today. I want to talk about the great pursuit. What's it look like to seek first? What, what's seeking God look like anyway? All right, y'all play hide and seek as a kid. What, 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 what are we trying to find? And there's four things that really make up stewardship. There's more than four, but this is the four I want you to start with. Number one is the pursuit of God. Number two is your time. You've been given 168 hours every week, 24 hours every day, 365 days in a year and you've been given so many years on this earth. What are you gonna do with your time? What are you gonna do with your treasure? You know, it's amazing, most, most, most people don't realize, but in a working lifetime, most people are gonna make well over a million. Now we're getting probably close to 1.5, 2 million. The average person will make well over 1.5 to 2 million dollars in a working lifetime, and yet most people in America, when they retire, they can barely write a check for $400, okay? So we have to be a steward of our treasure, and then our talent. God has given each of you giftings, things you're good at, personalities. He's given you things that, you know, some of us are mechanically inclined, some of us are, are, are inclined with singing, some of us are inclined with people skills, some of us are in, inclined with grace and mercy. There's all sorts of different giftings that God has given us. And in your life planning, you can get much more detailed than what I just named, but I think when it comes to seeking first the kingdom of God, that's where we need to start. So let's talk about seeking first and talking about the pursuit of God. Psalms 37 and 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord. You know, sometimes in life, life wants to hand us lots of cool things. I, I enjoy watching a good movie. I watched an old Western with, with uh, some of the old school, like Robert Duvall the other day. I really enjoyed that. I like those, some of those older, older Westerns, I think they're just great. Really enjoyed it. I like watching man movies. I think you can take romantic comedy, flush them down the toilet. But that's me. I'll watch it for Andrea. But, you know, I enjoy those things. I, I enjoy watching a good basketball game. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have a dog in the fight, but last, I think it was uh, Thursday night, Purdue and IU. Excellent basketball game. No matter what side you're on, you have to say that was a great game. I mean, and, and, and I know there's some Purdue fans disappointed, but we're, however, you, it was still a great for the game of basketball. Great for the game of basketball. So, we like all those things, but how is it that it's so easy to sit down and watch Netflix 
for 120 minutes and then trying to read our Bible for 15 feels like an eternity. Has anybody ever, ever felt like that before? Or, you know, if Pastor Matt, you know, we start to, uh, look, I, I know what the, the, I'm trying to see what time it is without giving it away to Pastor Matt look is. You know, you're waiting for me to preach over here. You pull out that seven, hmm, seven more minutes. Yeah. We'll go over here and they're just sneaking a peek at the watch. 12 more minutes. Just gauging it, man. I hope that stomach just hold out, baby. Hopefully it rizzos today. There's not a line. Get right in. Jesus' name. I know how it is. But, but, but how is it that seriously 90 minutes in church feels longer sometimes than 120 minutes of watching your favorite movie? And, 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 and I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to say, you wicked, foul devils, you know. But, but I'm here to help you become stewards of your life, okay? And, and I think this verse right here, Psalms 37, 4, is something we need to pray over ourselves. It says, I will delight, or it says, delight yourself in the Lord. One of the prayers I've prayed over myself for a long time is, Lord, I delight myself in you. Because we want to confess that over ourselves to get to the point where our appetite is conditioned to want the things of God more than the things of this earth. Amen. One of the great benefits of fasting that you, many of you participated in the fast, and, and man, it was great to do it. It's great to be done. <laughs> Hallelujah. But one of the things about fasting is it, it's a time of retraining your brain and your soul to say, I don't want to put so much emphasis on the things of this world but I want to put emphasis on the things of God, okay? And so we, we do have to try to calibrate our hearts to say, I delight myself, not just, I, I don't want to be just, I read the Bible because I have to. I want to delight myself in reading the Bible. I don't go to church because I have to. I want to go to church because it's a delight. I don't want to go to, I don't want to pray because I have to pray, and if I don't, God's mad at me, and I'm going to be a terrible person. I want to pray because I want to talk to my father, Okay, it's a delight to serve the Lord. It's a delight to do these things. And so we have, to, part of that is just retraining our soul because our soul has been conditioned by the things of this earth, okay? Our, I mean, we love, our soul loves Netflix. Our soul loves food. Our soul loves sports. Our soul loves shopping. And, and there's all those things. There's nothing wrong with those things. We just need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all those other things take care of themselves. So delight ourselves in the Lord. And then Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I couldn't pray for an hour. That's because you've never tried. Man, you'd be surprised how, how much you can pray if you put your heart in it. If we begin to delight ourselves in it, it you know, I mean, we, we, we can watch, you know, for, for the men, it, it's nothing for, I mean, you sit down and watch The Godfather, that's almost a three-hour movie. Uh, there's some of those better, ladies, you want to watch The Titanic? That's a three-hour movie. You know, we, we can watch a three-hour movie, oh, I can't pray for now. Well, that's because we're not delighting ourselves in the right things. I want to I wanna invite you today, taste and see the Lord is good. Taste and see that when, and it's not about, look, don't, don't, don't walk out of here today and say, well, it's all about whether or not I can pray for an hour. That's not what it's about. That's not the point. You miss, okay? The point is, as we delight ourselves in the things of God, our desires change, and we begin to desire to be more with him and less with the things of this world. That's what, and, 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 and if we do it the right way, it's not out of religious obligation and, oh, man, i got to go to church again. It's, praise God, it's Sunday, hot dog, here we go. Okay. Where I'm from in Ohio, and I've lived in Indiana more than I, I'm, 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 I think I'm an official Hoosier. I've lived in Indiana longer than any other state I've lived in. Lived in Indiana now since 1995. That's 27 years, okay. So I, I think that would have qualified me as a Hoosier. But in Ohio, I lived in the foothills to the Appalachians. And uh, the area I'm from is one of the Bigfoot capitals of the United States. Okay, as a matter of fact, two miles from our house is where the most Bigfoot sightings happen in the Midwest. My grandmother was a saint. My grandmother went to her grave swearing 
she saw Bigfoot on our property. I mean, she was adamant. And, and I'll just tell you this. I mean, people are so into Bigfoot uh, where I'm from, I would never, seriously, I would never walk into the woods uh, without wearing orange. Uh, I'm serious. People say, oh, there's Bigfoot. Boom, shoot him. <laughs> and, think, and, and where I live, man, people shoot anything. I, when it was hunting season, I, I'm serious. My grandpa called, called me up and said, Matt, he said, go get all the horses this whole week, lock them in the barn. Grandpa, people can't tell the difference between a horse and a deer? Nope, they can't. Put them in the barn, trust me. <laughs> so if they, if, if, they, if they mistake a horse for a deer, they're definitely going to mistake me for Bigfoot. <laughs> I don't go in the woods without wearing orange, I guarantee it. Back home, you don't do it. Bigfoot is the reigning hide-and-seek champion of the world. Would you agree with that? There's people, we, we've dedicated whole shows about going out and finding Bigfoot. We want, we want to find Bigfoot. Uh, merchandise, programs. You go to certain tourist areas and you can, rent, you can go out on a Bigfoot tour. They'll take you in these giant vehicles to go out at night. And I'm sure that's exactly what's going to find Bigfoot. A, a giant vehicle. You're seeking Bigfoot, you're not going to find him. It's one thing Jesus and Bigfoot don't have in common, because Jesus wants to be found. You see, the Bible tells us, if you draw near to God, James 4, 8, he'll draw near to you. Matthew 7, 7, and 8 tells us, ask and it will be given to you, uh, knock, it will be opened, and seek and you will find. If you look for Jesus, you'll find him. If you look for Jesus, that, that's why, I, I, I don't want to be religious about this, I don't want, I don't want to beat anybody up over this. But sometimes when I hear people say things, you're kind of telling on yourself a little bit. I've heard people say, well, you know, I just don't feel anything when I pray. Or, I've tried reading the Bible, I just don't understand anything. What, what, we're, what we're, we don't realize we're saying with that is, I've, I've not really given myself over to it to allow God to have his way in me. Okay, we're, 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 such a, we're, we're surface deep, and the Lord is inviting us to go deeper. And if we would taste and see that the Lord is good, it's like, and, and it's almost like your kid, when they're three or four years old, and you put, you know, some type of food in front of them they never had before, especially if it's green. And they say, I don't like it. And we say, how do you know you don't like it? Well, because I don't like it, but you've never tried it. And finally, as a parent, you know, you put your fist down, you're going to try this, and the kid puts it in their mouth, and before it's even had a chance to get to their tongue, they say, I hate it. That's almost how I, 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 sometimes that's what I hear when I hear people say, well, I don't understand, I just can't understand the Bible. Well, man, you've never tried it. You'll stick it, if you'll just chew on it a while. If, if, and, 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 and there's, uh, speaking of sipping, you remember the first taste of beer you tasted? As a kid, bah! That stuff tastes nasty. How do you go from that to ad, adults who, hated the taste, to, they forced themselves to drink it because that's what adults do, till all of a sudden they say, hey, I like the taste of beer. Well, if we can do that with worldly spirits, why can't we do that with godly spirits? <laughs> taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. I, I mean, seriously, you forced yourself to learn how to drink coffee, you forced yourself to learn how to drink beer, why can't we force ourselves to get an appetite for the Word of God? That's good, Pastor. I'm going to buy the CD on this one, buddy. <laughs> and our men's fast, we, we had a, our group get together, and we said, what are we doing this for? And we, we put a whiteboard up. And we said, you know, we're fasting to become better men, better, better husbands, better fathers, better, better child, children of God. What does that look like? And we begin to list traits that we would consider this is what a mature Christian looks like. This is, what, this is the target we're aiming for. And it had a lot of light bulbs come on. And I want to just share with you today this pursuit of God. What are we looking for? We're looking for Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're we're looking to be like him. And let, let me give you 
what you're going to find when you find Jesus. Okay, and he wants to be found. If you draw near, you will find him. You will find him. And uh, here we go. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this through this relatively quickly because I, I have some things I want to give you at the end I want to save time for. What are you going to find when you find Jesus? Number one, he is good. Psalms 34 and 8, we've already read it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Moses, he said, God, I want to see you. You know, M Moses was, was one of the most greatest men of faith that's ever walked on the face of the earth. He had such an intense relationship with God. I, I mean, when I read about Moses, I think, man, he embodied the heart of God almost more than any other person in the Bible. I just see the heart of God in him. And he says, God, I want to be with you. I want to see you. And God finally says, okay, I'll let you see my hinder parts. I'll let, uh, you can't see all of me, but I'll let you see just a glimpse. And what it says in Exodus 33, it, gives an, a, a, it tells us about this encounter. And it says in verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing you've spoken, for you found grace in my sight. I know you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make my goodness pass before you. When God wanted to show Moses who he was, he said, I want, you're going to see my goodness. There's a saying we have around here, God is good. His word is true, and it works in your life. I want you to know that when you find God, you're going to find he is a good, good God. John 10 tells us, the thief comes with the steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Verse 11 continues, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's who you're going to find when you find Jesus. See, this pursuit of God, I'm not asking you to pursue somebody that has a self-interest. I'm not asking you to do something so I get a kickback in return. Look, I, God's not giving me kickbacks for every one of you that's in church. I, I, don't get a, I don't get a bonus at the end of the year from heaven based on how many of you read so many chapters of the Bible. I'm not doing this for selfish gain. And Jesus did not lay his life down for his own selfishness. He laid his life down for you. He is the good shepherd. He cares about you. He loves you. He created you knowing you would be a sinner, knowing you would be flawed, knowing there might even be a time in your life you held up your middle finger to him and he still loved you and forgave you. He's good. Isn't that good news today? That's who you're going to find in the 1800s, a man named Alan Gardner was a missionary to South America. And by every natural observation, you'd say he failed. He experienced many physical difficulties, hardships. And at the age of 57, in the year 1851, he died of disease and starvation while serving in the Picton Island at the southern tip of South America. They found his body, his diary was nearby, and his diary bore the record of hunger, thirst, wounds, and loneliness. But the very last entry in his diary said, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Wow. Number two, when you find Jesus, you're going to find that he has a servant's heart. John 13, verses 3 through 5 Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was giving to God or going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. This is the Jesus we're going to find. When we seek this Jesus, his heart is a heart of a servant. Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and gave his life a ransom for many. Don't know if you've ever been to a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A, but if you have, you're going to notice there's a very big difference in the operating philosophy. You can't go to Chick-fil-A today, it's Sunday they're closed, but you can go tomorrow you'll probably pay a couple dollars more than you'd pay for going to McDonald's. But I can assure you, if you go to McDonald's, you sometimes might get a bag of French fries this full, sometimes this full, 
Sometimes they're floppy, sometimes they're this, sometimes they're burnt. Oh, you want us to get your order right? That's extra. <laughs> if they put Chick-fil-A in charge of COVID, we'd be better by now. You ever go to one of their drive throughs buddy? They got 18,000 cars. You, you think, oh, this one take forever. No, two minutes. Go to McDonald's, you're the only car. 20 minutes. I'm sorry, I gave up. <laughs> I, I, I just gave up. You know, I, I, here in town, I'm, I'm not speaking against any local McDonald's or anything like that, but I just found out you can go to in the Rizzo's or the Mexican restaurant, you can get your food faster, and it tastes a lot better, and it's the same price. I'm not endorsing any particular <laughs> restaurant. But just step aside, please. Y'all remember that one? Step aside. Pull up. Chick-fil-A, my pleasure. We'll do that for you. Go sit down. We'll bring it to you. Talk about customer service, buddy. They give it out. You know, that comes from the old CEO. His name was Truett Cathy. And Truett Cathy modeled a lifestyle of service. He was traveling with one of his senior advisors or board members. And for whatever reason, they had to share a hotel room. And uh, he asked his buddy, his, his traveling companion, he said, what time do you want to get up in the morning? He said, well, I got to get up early. I got to iron my clothes. I hate to iron my clothes. So the next morning when they got up, he found out his clothes had already been ironed. True, Kathy had ironed his clothes for him. You see, it was at the top, that attitude of service. And it goes all the way down to the person making $10 an hour at the local Chick-fil-A. Jesus came to serve. That is the culture of the kingdom, is the culture of a servant's heart. Number three, Jesus, when you find him, you're going to find he's forgiving. You know what Lamentations tells us, chapter 3, verse 22, though the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, or through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You know, sin, Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden, they ran from God. They should have ran to God. The difference between Adam and Eve and David, David did stuff far worse than Adam and Eve. David, I mean, David really messed up bad. Yet David got forgiveness. Adam and Eve, the reason they got kicked out, I just think, what would have happened, folks, if when Adam and Eve realized what they had done, they had ran to God, bowed down, said, we have sinned, we are so sorry, please forgive us, they would have tapped into the mercy of God right there. We'd still be in the Garden of Eden. Once again, when I get to heaven, buddy, Adam and Eve, they are getting William and Charles. I mean, I know I, we're in heaven, I can get forgiveness, but bless God. I mean, there's a whole lot of difficulty you and I experience because of Adam and Eve's sin. Buddy, they're going to get it. Ladies, you ought to be the first ones to get to Eve, man. It's her fault you got through all that stuff you do. Just, just you get to heaven, just, just pow. Just, take, just make a line. Pow, pow, pow. That's not very Christian. You're right, it's not, but I can get forgiveness. I'm kidding. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're going to sin. I don't want you to sin. God doesn't want you to sin, but you're going to sin. And when you do, don't run from God. Run to God. He's the great forgiver. He wants, he, your, his love for you is bigger than your sin. His love for you is bigger than what you did wrong. He wants you to come home. He, when you mess up, he doesn't want you to run away from him. He wants you to run to him. An atheist said this. He said, if there is a God, may he prove himself by striking me dead right now. <laughs> Nothing happened. You see, there is no God, the atheist stated. Another stated, you've only proved he is a gracious God. And he is. And lastly, you're going to find that Jesus is your friend. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. John 15, 13 tells us, greater love has no man than this than to lay one's life down for his friends. John 15, 14 and 15, Jesus speaking, he said, you are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, 
But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. When you're seeking Jesus and you're delighting yourself in him and you're tasting and seeing the Lord is good, you're going to find you do have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I would like to tell you that from here on out, you are not going to experience any hardship in life, but I would be lying to you that when we are going through this journey called life together, there are going to be many mountaintops and there are going to be some terrible valleys. And I want you to know that though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you can fear no evil for God is with you. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. And in the midst of the valley of death, he can lead you beside the still waters. He can lead you to the those green pastures. His plan for you is good to protect you, to preserve you, to rescue you, to heal you, to deliver you, to provide for you. He has a hope for you. God, when he created you, he didn't see a failure. He saw a son or a daughter created in the image and likeness of God. And his plan for you from eternity past to eternity future is good. That's who we're serving and seeking today. Jackie Robinson, if you know your baseball, you know the, the first African-American man to really break into the Major League Baseball system. Thank God for pioneers who were willing to risk all for the sake of progress. The first black player to play, play Major League Baseball, he faced jeering crowds in every stadium. While playing in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he committed an error. The fans began to ridicule him. He stood there at second base, humiliated, and the fans kept booing and jeering and calling him names. The shortstop, Pee Wee Reese, came over and stood next to him. He put his arm around Jackie Robinson and faced the crowd. The crowd grew quiet. Jackie Robinson stated later that that saved his career. That is the friendship of Jesus. This month I have challenged you to seek first the kingdom of God. Not out of religious tradition, not out of duty, but out of spiritual hunger. And you'll find out he is a good God. He has a servant's heart. He'll forgive you, and he is your friend. And at closing, you don't have this in your notes. If you pull out your bulletin, I want you to write this down if you can. If I don't have a pen, there's one in the chair back in front of you. I want, I want a list for you, a basic guide to how to seek God. Very basic teaching. Where do I start? Number one, you gotta know what season it is. Human nature likes extremes, okay? There are people here in different seasons of life. And different seasons, your pursuit is going to look different. If you're a mother and you have small children at home, your season is going to look different than somebody who is retired or somebody who does not have children, okay? If you're married, your season looks different than somebody who's single, okay? If, if, if you are in a leadership position at work and maybe you're going through, uh, there's a factory upgrade coming or there's, there's, there's a season at work where you have to produce and they're demanding 60 and 70 hours a week. That's a season you're in. Okay, now we don't want to make a lifetime out of that season, but we have to know we're in seasons. And there are some people that they have a gifting or, or it's part of their genetic package that they have the ability to have a very regimented and structured devotional process. They get up at a certain time every day they have their routine. They drink exactly 8.3 ounces of coffee. They read exactly this many chapters. They pray for exactly this minutes. 
They have the same spot. They've got, they put their knees in the same place on the carpet. The carpet's worn out there. And we are appreciative of those people. That is awesome. However, I will tell you, not everybody has that ability. Some people's schedule varies every single day, okay? And, and it's very difficult to say, I wake up at 5 to pray at 5.30, when one day you, you're on first, a couple months later you're on seconds, and your job schedule changes, you, can only, you have to function within the season that you're living in. Is that, is that fair to everybody? And what we don't want to do is judge somebody else's season based on the season we're in. Okay, the Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Sometimes people ask me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to open up a can here, but you'll just have to deal with me. Uh, but let's, let's open it up. A lot of times I get asked as a pastor, Pastor, what do you believe? And, and the, the, the basic doctrine is this. Do you believe in once saved, always saved, or can somebody lose their salvation? And people try to ask me that. They're, I've never found anybody who's asking that question who really wanted to know. <laughs> they always already have their opinion, and they want to see if my opinion matches their opinion. They're not about to change their opinion. Here's what I, here's what I think. I love you. I think it's the wrong question. That question is a, violates scriptural principles. Okay? Because the question I'm going to ask them is, why do you ask? And they always want to know for it's a family, a friend, somebody else that they know who was living here and now they've stopped. And that scripture teaches to work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. So I think that question is rooted in the wrong faith or it's not rooted in faith, it's rooted more in unbelief, okay? It's also, we must also understand that God is a just and fair God. And Scripture teaches us to seek the Lord with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. That's what I tell people. Do that, you won't have to worry about the answer. Is that fair? All right, as people say, well, tell us, Pastor, what do you believe? Well, I have a strong belief, and I can theologically prove it, and I can also disprove the other belief very, very quickly, but uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We, we seek, the, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and might. Work out your own salvation. We, and then, we say, well, Pastor, if someone has fallen, then let's pray for that person Let's believe God for that person. And, and it's not our job to judge. Do you think I get to be the one in heaven to say this person gets in and this person doesn't? That's Jesus' answer, not mine. None of, us is gonna, none of us is Jesus. Amen. We ain't Jesus. So he's going to be the one that determines that, not me. Praise God. Got it? Now, uh, a lot of times, what, what is the other thing I say along with those lines? Um, all, both of those camps, by the way, they're ultimately saying the same thing. Uh, for, and and my, one of the questions I asked the person is, well, let's suppose Johnny uh, goes out, becomes a Nazi. They went to VBS as a kid, got saved at VBS, become a Nazi, go kill 100 people just because of their genetic ethnicity. They kill Christians, they rape people, they murder for fun. Do they, now, they, they, at VBS, they said the sinner's prayer. Do they go to heaven? And both sides will say, no, that person doesn't go to heaven. The one says, well, they were saved and lost. The other one says they were just never saved to begin with. It never took. But they both agree that person ain't getting to heaven. Fair enough. But I'm, I'm off topic here. Let's get back on topic. Number one. Know the season you're in. Avoid extremes. You want to seek first the kingdom? There's nothing in Scripture that tells us, Adam, that you've got to pray seven hours today. Okay? I, I, my goal here is not to get you all praying seven hours a day. 
because you got a life to live. All right. Seek the Lord. Seven pillars. Here we go. Here's what it should look like for your everyday person in your regular season of life, your, 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 your basic American life. Here we go. Number one, we ought to be seeking the Word of God. We need to have a relationship with our Bible. Okay, it looks different for different people. But that Bible ought to be getting opened on hopefully a daily basis. But if not, at least a few times a week, we're getting into the Bible. I don't want to put on you how many minutes, how many chapters. That's different for every person. But you pray and ask the Holy Spirit, but we need to open the Bible. Number two, we need to talk to God every day. We need to learn to talk to God. That's called prayer. Okay. Pillar of seeking God. Get in the Word. Pray. Number three, get your butt to church. Okay. Uh, get in church. Now I'm taught preaching to the choir. Sometimes the devil would love to take you out of church. I've seen people for a season, you know, job changes, life changes. Maybe they have to step back for a while. I understand. We're compassionate, that type of thing. But as a rule of thumb, we ought to be in church. Okay? How much? Well, let me, let me, let me put you, I see this. When, how long should I read my Bible? How many minutes should I pray? How often should I go to church? Let me ask you this question. You're already looking at your watches. You're like, I want to go to Rizzo's. <laughs> Got to get the pasta. So, so when you go to Rizzo's today and they set the pasta in front of you, when do you quit eating? Do you keep ordering dishes? I want the pasta. I want the burger. I want the Reuben. Bring it all. When do you stop eating at a buffet? When you're full. Does that make sense? How, how much word should you put in you a day? Till you're full. How much prayer should you do? Till you're full. Now, I went out to dinner with some of you guys. There's some of you that really tick me off. You, you eat like four bites. It's like, oh, I'm so full, I can't eat another bite. I just want to, Bam! I just, I hate your gut. I like the, 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 especially you girls. Oh, I forgot to eat today. Shut up. Everybody hates you. Everybody hates you. Man, you know, back in the day when I was, a, I mean, we, me and my buddies, we'd go into the buffet, and buddy, that Chinaman, he looking, and he's, he's just standing over us just count, counting how much money he's losing, you know. Don't, no, don't bring no more chicken out. No more chicken. No more. He eat all my chicken. We have different appetites. Eat till you're full. All right? Some of you, what I, what I like to be able to wave my magic wand and make everybody live an ideal, perfect life that pleases Pastor Matt, sure. Just like the beginning. But I like to say that, I just like to tell you, everybody in here, don't ever sip a wine again. Bless God, that's the law. Can't do it. I, I'd like to tell you, everybody ought to be in Sundays, everybody ought to be here Wednesdays, everybody ought to be at, every time the Lord's open, you ought to be here. Can't do it. Everybody's different. You got different seasons, different journeys. You got to do the best you can with what you got to work with. Fair enough? But seek first the kingdom of God. Fourth pillar is giving. Fifth pillar is serving. Sixth pillar, sharing your faith. And the seventh pillar is fellowship. Those seven pillars really hold up your spiritual house of your life. And the last thing I'll share with you, number one, know your season. Number two, the seven pillars and number three, the filter. When you're living your life out, filter your decisions and your conduct through the word of God. Okay? This, when you're trying to figure out, you got a job opportunity, you're trying to figure out uh, 
Should you take a promotion? It's going to mean this when you're trying to figure out how to spend your money. Use the Word of God. Or I'll tell you what. When you're trying to figure out what you're going to watch on Netflix, use the Word of God as your filter. Put the Word first. Live your life using the Word as the filter. And what survives through the Word of God, that's your life. That's the God kind of life. Okay, and I'll give you an example and then we'll go home. One of my great mentors, uh, Dr. Dean Radke, um, just one of the wisest businessmen on the planet. Um, Dr. Radke, uh, you may have heard of the Avon Makeup Corporation. Um, he was the number two man in that corporation. You may, uh, Admiral John S. McCain, John McCain, the politician's dad, he was his direct report. Uh, he was the admiral of the U.S. Navy, and Dean Radke was his, his ensign. He basically was his errand boy, and, and uh, they're in the control tower with him. Then he went on to manage the limited corporation, which in the 1980s was the hottest stock on Wall Street, along with Microsoft. And Dr. Radke, when he was at the Limited, uh, and they has all these stores, Structure, Limited Express, Jones, New York, Abercrombie and Fitch, and they were getting ready to launch a new product line called Victoria's Secret. And he saw the marketing, and he saw where they were trying to take the company. And it absolutely impeded his conscience. And he went and talked to it about with the Lord, and the Lord said, you got to quit. And he tried to talk the Lord out of it. said, but God, I'm not all the way vested. If I stay two more years, I get all these millions of dollars. And God said, no, you got to quit. And he left behind his position at the limited. And it hurt. And he left behind millions of dollars on the table. I say all that to say, he took the word, his life, filtered it through the word, and then as a result, his life now has had an impact that's reached nations. Sometimes it doesn't come how we think it should come, but if we'll do it God's way, it'll yield God's reward. All these things shall be added unto you. And when God gives it, there is no sorrow with it. Let's pray and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this wonderful service. We bless these people today as they go. I bless their families, their children. And Lord, as we go, let us be in pursuit of you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, we'll see you out there. Meet the pastor. I'll see you in about five minutes.